Hi. Oh, it's on. It's actually on. Wow. <laughs> It's exciting. I don't usually introduce myself, um, but um, I have 30 minutes and I have 30 slides, so I'm just going to jump right into it. Uh, my name is Carrie Miller. I'm a software developer, and um, although I sometimes refer to myself as a heavy metal software developer, developer because my title is lead software development engineer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I work at GitHub. Um, I, this is not me, but it's one of my favorite of the Octocats. Of like, there's like 80 or 90 of them now. Um, I think they're pretty spectacular. Uh, in addition to being a software engineer, um, I'm also a conference organizer. Um, I am a conference organizer for MoonConf, but also for Open Source and Feelings, which is a two-day conference in Seattle, Washington, um, with a lot of the same kind of talks, although we focus a little bit more on uh, the soft talks and uh, community organization and how do you run open source projects, and uh, especially this year, looking at the role of open source in our communities and how can open source um, serve communities and how, what do communities need from open source. So that's kind of uh, what I do now, although in the past uh, I was not always a software developer. Uh, in fact, I was a liberal arts major. Um, I was literally a moon bat. <clears throat> Goddard College, yes, it's one of those colleges. Um, here's a joke for you. Why did the Goddard student cross the road? to get credit. <laughs> uh, no, I started my career as a lighting designer, uh, designing lights and staging for primarily uh, like dance and uh, musical productions. Um, and then Fish stopped touring, so I had to get a real job. And uh, <clears throat> I got a job at a local web design company and kind of turned it into a career from there. So I've been doing this for about 20 years. Um, but uh, about 10 years ago, uh, I was wrapping up a five-year stint at Amazon. Uh, the New York Times article is pretty much true. Um, and I was done. I was completely, absolutely, 100% burned out and done with software. I hated it. And what I did instead was I became a professional poker player. Now, I'd always, I'd always been a player of games, if you will, right? I was into Dungeons and Dragons, and like earlier than that, like I was that kid who went to the local public library and got all the books on Scrabble and Monopoly, and I sat there and I graphed out the probabilities of like every, every spot on the Monopoly board, and I would like keep track of the letters that were used in Scrabble so I could know the probabilities of drawing things. I'd, uh, yeah, it was pretty, that was pretty great. And there's some pretty brutal, uh, brutal games of cribbage and pitch in my family on camping trips. But um, in the early aughts, um, while at a Dungeons and Dragons game, funnily enough, um, it was hosted at a, a friend of mine's house who had been a professional player, a poker player in the 90s. And I said, hey, Brian, I I'm really curious about this poker thing. Can you recommend a book? Well, that was the, that was the moment um, that I found out about poker. And it's not just poker that was played on TV or in the movies, which is kind of a, a weird little facsimile of, of poker. In the early aughts, this guy, Chris Moneymaker, his real, actual, legitimate name is Chris Moneymaker. Like, he is like the marketer's dream. Um, he's just some guy, and he entered a $33 tournament online on an online poker site and turned it into several million dollars by winning the World Series of Poker main event, which is the Wimbledon of, of poker. I don't know why I went to tennis, but there you go. So anyway, in the mid-aughts, um, poker is hot. I'm playing poker. Why not go pro, right? Um, well, because my mom, um, and I love my mom. I have a really great relationship with my mom. My mom is afraid that everything that you put in your body is going to addict you to something about it, right? Uh, and she always had this saying that, you know, gambling is a problem. The lottery is a tax on people who can't do math. Well, as my mom also likes to remind me, the last math class that I passed, actually passed, was pre-algebra. Um, I didn't technically pass algebra, but they promoted me because I aced the final. Uh, and then I dropped out in geometry. So I'm horrible at math, right? So obviously, gambling is the lifestyle for me. <laughs> so have you heard that saying, though, that you know, like gambling is a tax on people? Um, and it kind of is in some ways. Um, but it's really about doing some very, very basic math. One moment. So let's say we're going to flip coins. And we're actually going to do it for money. So when it comes up heads, you give me a dollar. When it comes up tails, I give you a dollar, right? We could do that all day long, and we'll probably come out about even, right? Like, the more we do it, the more likely we are to, 
to show a net loss or profit with each other of zero dollars and be perfectly happy. The trick when you're a professional gambler is that you don't get a dollar, you try to get a dollar ten. I will do this with you all day long. Does anyone want to do this with me all day long? Eventually, I'm going to make money. It's not necessarily the fastest way to make money, flipping coins over and over and over again, but it's guaranteed profit in the long term for me, right? Sometimes I'm going to be down, but in the long run, I will be up. And this is how casinos make their money on slot machines and blackjack and cribbage. Not cribbage, they don't play. Is there, is there actually like black or uh, casino cribbage? There's casino <laughs> war. I've seen that. Anyway, the house is always ahead, right? Um, the casino always has some sort of slight advantage. They're getting a dollar ten every time they give you, instead of giving you a dollar. Um, and people always come up with these systems for how to beat casino games. Um, you want to hear my advice on how to beat blackjack? Yes. yes. yes? It's, yeah, exactly. It's a game where you, you get banned just for watching what's going on. Uh, if you actually, quote unquote, count the cards, if you're just an intelligent person. <laughs> so mathematically, you can't beat casino games. However, there's two things in a casino that you can actually beat because the casino doesn't really care about, um, they're not the bank, they're not the ones holding the bag if you, know, you actually win. Uh, and that's sports betting, which is a fascinating topic, and I will talk your ear off of it, but not right now. Uh, and poker, where in the poker room, they just simply take a small fee. So that's what I did for about a year. I traveled up and down the West Coast, occasionally Atlantic City, and just sat around in card rooms until a friend came up with a really good startup idea. But how do you get that extra 10 cents? The key to that is having more information than your opponents. It's a little bit like lying, but not really. Most gamblers will never take a bet without an edge, real or perceived. Information is the gold, is the gold standard here. Unlike a game of chess or, or Go, poker is a game of incomplete information. In chess or Go, you get to see the position of every piece that's on the board. Um, similar to our test suites, where we get to see every single input, we get to test all the outputs. In poker, however, cards are hidden. Motives are a little bit murky. In the real world, our software encounters users. We never know what they're going to they're gonna type in. Poker as a game, then, is really this conversation between two opponents that are fumbling around in this fog of uncertainty trying to find each other. Um, and they, someone's usually sad at the end. When we operate in this world of incomplete information, um, we've built a lot of tools to handle that, a lot of process to deal with how we don't really know ever what's going on. Um, Agile is a really big one on this, right? The idea that we understand the general trajectory of things. We understand like the project is going to take maybe four months, and we're probably going to use these three technologies. But we don't necessarily know all of the, the inputs into that final equation. So whenever somebody says that they have a perfect system for me, they say, oh, if you do TDD, you're going to be great. Or Elixir is going to be the awesome thing this year. We should build everything in Elixir now. I always kind of like look askance because it's so incredibly context dependent. Things are going to happen along the way that I can't account for. Dave Sklansky wrote this very uh, interesting book on poker where he posited this basic theory and it boils down to basically the person who can gather more information about the, the situation and play optimally in that uh, environment is the one who will win money. And when you play suboptimally, you will lose money. When you make choices about technology, you will be rewarded based on how much information you have gathered about the context that you've built to be able to understand how that, that software will perform within it. Because code is compromise, right? Everything, every time we write code, every commit into our source control is a decision that we're making, that one approach is better than another. We can pick these different technologies without under necessarily understanding the perfectness of them within the context of that environment. So just like an organism existing within um, an ecosystem evolves into quote unquote perfection, it's only perfect for that ecosystem. 
So when you ask a poker player, or really a good software developer, what they, what about a solution, it kind of comes back to this idea of uncertainty. I live at sea level, so I apologize. It's actually a little hard to get, uh, actually get out of breath. So anyway, in poker, this is kind of the stock answer. You know, it's kind of saying like, well, let's turn it off and turn it back on again. You know, it's kind of the half joke. You kind of say it, you know, um, without really meaning it. But there's a kernel of truth to it, right? Sometimes just turning things off and back on, like just restart it, it'll work. I think that's the whole point of Unicorn. But it's this idea of context uh, and, and how well suited something is to that context. In poker, there, there is a variety of hands. There's hundreds of starting hands you could have. Um, and uh, some are, are generally considered to be marginal. You know? It's like in Shakespeare we say, oh, that's one of the lesser plays when we talk about one of his stinkers. You know? um, there are poker hands that are marginal. There are technical choices that are hmm, not so great. But in the right situation, it might actually be the powerhouse solution to the problems that you're facing. Now, unfortunately, there's too many contexts for us to really, really be able to understand that at the outset. In poker, there's 2.1 billion possible uh, hand matchups uh, for Texas Hold'em. Uh, if I was to play a game called Omaha, uh, that would <laughs> quadrillions, if not pentabillions. Quintillions? What's the fifth? All right. Quintillions. Quint, quint, quintillions with a T. Excellent. So anyway, yeah, I, I once tried to calculate this by brute force under, using Ruby, because you know Ruby can't scale. And it took about five minutes. Um, and uh, I also I used that as an example in one of my, my teaching classes about big O problems. Um, and so in the poker world, what you end up doing is you, start, you memorize the, the likelihood of certain types of situations. Um, because in the words of one of our American great poets, every hand's a winner and every hand's a loser. See, nobody knows Kenny Rogers. <laughs> nobody does. He is. He's a goddamn American treasure. Of course, I only knew, I only knew this song from his appearance on The Muppet Show, so... <laughs> I had a boss who looked just like him. No kidding. <laughs> Like old Kenny or new Kenny? Like this. Okay. See, I can see he's got a rugged, like rugged, handsome, you know, frontier quality. The new Kenny's a little, little too LA. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, it's, it's all that chicken money from his uh, fried chicken chain. So anyway, how do you do it when you've got all these billions of possible <laughs> situations? Like, like, how do you understand what's going on? Like, how do you start to build a context in those seconds that you have to respond? I mean, it's not like I'm not, at the, when I'm at the poker table, I'm not like a software architect. I can't go hide in my cave for four weeks and come out with a Visio graph. You know, I have to make an actual decision, you know, within seconds. And so we end up using heuristics. And I think in technology, we do that sort of same sort of thing, right? These are like informal rules or guidelines to make decisions about, about software. And as I've joked before, Ruby, of course, cannot scale possibly ever, um, you know, or that functional languages are completely uh, inaccessible. Uh, the folks from Code for Denver earlier, I apologize uh, for not remembering your names, um, pointed this out that they were having a lot of success teaching people who are new to code functional languages because they're not carrying this baggage of having come up through C or a, a more object oriented uh, tradition. So they don't, they're not hampered by that. Um, I myself right now, I'm trying to learn C. I'm primarily a Ruby developer with a dash of closure. Um, and I'm struggling with it because I'm carrying that baggage of all these decisions and heuristics I know from Ruby into C. And I gotta write my own loops, like, ah, oh, man, this is ridiculous. So anyway, we have these heuristics for judging uh, our, our software and our tools, and while they're generally true, these are not perfect guidelines. These are leprechauns. They're, they're myths that we tell ourselves that explains quite a bit, quite a bit of the world around us or the environment that we find ourselves in, but they're not really true necessarily. I love The Karate Kid. It's one of my favorite movies. Um, and. Uh, 
early in my poker career, I was, I was uh, staying at a friend's house, watching him play online poker, and uh, he lost a hand. Uh, it was a pretty sizable four-digit sum. Um, it was more than the value of my car at that moment. So I was a little, <laughs> man, like I would just want to go start drinking. I would have been drinking long before at the stakes he was playing. But I just saw him lose you know, several thousand dollars. And I'm like, what, what was his reaction to this? It was simply to shrug and move on. And he said, it's okay, I usually win there. And it was mind-blowing to me, the idea that like, you, you should be focusing not on the results of a decision, but on the process that got you there. And if the result was bad, you can go back and re-examine the process, but you can't make decisions about your environment based on that actual result. And this is one of the important themes in poker, and I think it's important too when we're looking at the long-term health and viability of architecture or teams or, or even organizations. In poker, we have this idea of the expect expected value. Um, you can say, I'm way ahead in expected value today. That's how I'm doing. You know, when I'm making all the right decisions, but I'm still getting unlucky. Because even a 15 to one shot sometimes comes in. When I've got the other player completely crushed and there's one card in the deck that's gonna help them. Sometimes they're just gonna get lucky and that's fine. Because if I, do the, if I make those coin flips over and over and over again, I'm gonna come out successful. So if I've got a successful process for developing software and it's worked every other time I've done it, I've used Kafka at every other place I've worked, I should use Kafka now, here, but it doesn't work. Is that because Kafka is a bad technology? Is it because something about the use case I didn't understand? Maybe it was simply I had the wrong engineers on the team or I had a bad apple somewhere. You know, maybe it's person, personal. So it's not about the result that should be educating me into the future, but how is my process? And then I can go back in a postmortem and examine that process that got us to those decisions to sort of see like, well, what didn't we know? Not what should we have known? At every uh, card room you go to, there's a, a EULA basically on the wall that just by walking in, you've implicitly agreed to. Um, and it's just like kind of basic rules, like the casino's gonna take this much of your money and like, you know, you, you can't like throw the food at people. Um, you can't pee on the dealer. You know, every time there's a rule, like there's someone's name attached to it. You know, there was an incident. Um, but one of the rules that I love about poker is that all players must protect the integrity of the game. And the, what this means is that if I have to go get a drink or use the restroom, I leave my money on the table, and that's okay, because everyone else is looking out for me. Um, if I spot somebody cheating, even if it's benefiting me somehow, I have a duty to say something about it. I have a duty to watch out for people who are cheating, not just me, but other people, and say something, and to observe. And if someone's making a horrible mistake, I'm honor bound to, to say something. And that kind of spills out over into the whole poker community. There are handshake deals over hundreds of thousands of dollars when you get up into the top tier players. Um, and it's just on your reputation alone that you know, these people, people are making these sorts of agreements with each other because we protect each other and we look out for the integrity of the game. In the software world, I wish we had more of that. I wish we had more more insight into protecting each other because whether you're a developer or a manager, people ops is the one, number one thing that you should be focusing on the most. It's what you're gonna spend the most life energy on. It's part of your job and you have to watch out for your people, the people that work for you, the people you work with, and yeah, the people who work above you. Do you know right now who on your team is struggling? Do you know who's hurting? Do you know who's having a great time? Do you know who you know, is maybe sick or is having a hard time and doesn't know enough to speak up or is too scared to speak up? And if you can't answer that question, you should probably go find out because it's gonna help you, it's gonna help your project, it's gonna help them. Um, Mike Caro is a, a poker author who wrote uh, this book called Mike Caro's Book of Tells. Um, he loves naming things after himself and one of the things he named after himself is uh, Caro's Threshold of Misery. Um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just read this real quick. Um, so suppose you're, you're a small to medium limit player. Um, you're comfortable losing, say, $500 in an evening. Maybe, maybe that number's higher or lower for you, but say, say you are comfortable losing $500. 
you're playing and suddenly you notice that you've lost a little bit more than $500, say $800. Well, it's not that much more than 500, so you keep playing. And then you look up and you realize, no, now you've lost $3,000. You've moved past, you're moving very close to what's this idea of the threshold of misery, where it simply doesn't matter anymore. There is so much pain, there is so much disappointment and struggle, and you are um, helpless in the face of defeat, that it doesn't matter. And people will continue to play and play badly past this point. This is the point that any further emotional pain simply isn't felt. I think this translates into, into our personal lives as well, because you know we could say like, well, my car wasn't worth much anyway, so I'm not gonna fix it, right? Like why bother maintaining my car? It's worth 200 bucks. So I'm not gonna put oil into it, I'm just gonna drive it around until it breaks. Or if you've overslept by two hours, well, hell with it, I'll just like write out this whole day instead of maybe time shifting or having a short day. Or one that uh, some, a lot of people find trouble with, you know? Well, I've had three drinks and, and there is no taxi here, so I'll just have another drink or two or three. I nearly know I really should refactor this massive if else block, but I'm just gonna add one more. It's like, whatever, it's just one more case statement. Just throw some JavaScript on it. The page, the page is already four megabytes, and a 200K for jQuery and gonna hurt. You know, these are the sorts of things we tell ourselves, right? Um, we, when we're, we're past this threshold of misery, where we simply, in this situation, we, we cease to be able to care about it because there's too much pain. And it's not that we're unprofessional. Um, we're not making these choices out of ignorance or malice. It's just simply, this is our emotional response to the situation we find ourselves in. And this is the environment in which your best engineers will start to leave you once they hit that point of pain. When they are no longer in, maybe uh, in charge of their, they never longer, no, excuse me, they no longer have the ability to affect change within their department or the code that they have to work in. When it becomes the easiest thing to do is not refactor the code, but add a case statement or throw some JavaScript on it or eh, spin up some more dinos. That, that'll solve the problem. You have to be aware when you're, when you're approaching these sorts of thresholds, not just in your professional life, when you're, you're about to make a choice that is less professional but is convenient and ceases some sort of pain. But in, in, your, in your personal life too, as well, because you, at this point, decisions no longer seem to matter. When the pain is maximized and anything else that goes wrong simply can't add any more to it. The secret in these moments is to continue to pretend to care to continue to act and perform at that level that, that has some sort of value. Because you don't want to be that developer who stops giving an F and tries to change the world, realizes after two weeks that you can't change the whole world and table flips and, and leaves. It's not good for you. It's not good for your team. It's not good for anything. It feels great in that moment to stop that pain. But can you push past that and continue to make optimal choices instead of suboptimal choices. An engineer who is at or past this, this threshold of pain is looking for any kind of signal that what they do matters. So if you spot someone on your team who's doing that, who's just kind of phoning it in or doing the bare minimum or cutting a lot of corners lately, try to find a way to connect with them. Try to find a way to like have some empathy for where they are. You don't have to sit down and like have a heart to heart about like the reorg and what their pain on that is, or like, man, I hate writing documentation, it's horrible and I have to do it all the time. But like, how can you get through that together? How can you lift them up and bring them along and support them? How can you catch them because they're about to fall? They're about to step off this cliff. a lot of pinball. We've got a, a pinball museum in Seattle. It's super cool. It's got like 50 or 60 pinball machines all crammed into this tiny little storefront. And you go and you, play, you pay a flat fee and you can play to your heart's content. Um, and I'm a horrible pinball player because uh, I'm the one who like, is always like 
banging up the machine and like making it do this. Poker taught me the value of emotional self-control. Didn't, didn't teach me how to do it. I mean, I'm a redhead and a Scorpio. I mean, come on. Um, but uh, in, in the poker world, when someone loses emotional control, we say they have gone on tilt. It's the same thing like, like the pinball machine. Like, it's just not working anymore, right? They've been jostled too hard. Um, and uh, people who are on tilt tend to play super suboptimally, right? Um, they'll spew money onto the table making horrible bets. They're, they're, they're trying to, to catch up to money that they lost sometimes. Um, or they're just mad at the world. And somehow, like, playing angry will somehow, like, make the world fair again. Um, and I've coded like that in different times in my life where I've coded angry because the world is not fair and I shouldn't have to fix this bug because it's Mike's problem and Mike's the jerk who wrote this in the first place and then he quit and now I've got to deal with it and so I'm going to take some stupid shortcut. To get good at poker, you have to learn how to deal with, with these sorts of like setbacks because like I said, sometimes those short, those, uh, those long odds are going to come in for your opponent and uh, you're going to lose. And you also have to look at the flip side of that too. There's this concept of winner's tilt, where people who are winning a lot of money, they also play suboptimally because they're being, there's this reinforcing story that they're a good player because they're winning money. So they'll start spewing money as well. And when you're a poker player, you have, you know, you're protecting the integrity of the game, but you're still there as a competitor, so you look out for that. But we're not competing with each other at software. So again, when I see somebody on, who's on tilt on my team, who's angry at that world, or is flying really, really high, you know, we again, we come back to that process through postmortems, through planning, through, discuss, through discussion and interrogation of each other's uh, ideas and philosophy to, to find some sort of common ground, some sort of sta uh, stability that is really the true perfection, equilibrium in, a, in, a, in that environment. I told you, I love Karate Kid. So you start with these great ideas, um, and maybe you heard it from a speaker at a conference, and you're going to throw some JavaScript on it. Um, and it might be something you've built a dozen times before. And you've got the best team in the whole wide world, but it just doesn't work out. If all the evidence uh, in a poker hand is, is, pointing, is pointing to the fact that I'm beat, that I, I thought I had the best hand, and there's only one hand out there that beats me, but boy, this person's, everything's telling me this person has it. It's okay, I can just fold and move on. Because again, I'm, I need to focus on that process of going, of, uh, of what I do. And in software, it's the same way. Like very often, like, I know Kafka is the answer. Kafka is gonna solve this problem and I can't convince anybody of it. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. I don't need to table flip about it. Or maybe we, and I don't know why I keep going back to Kafka. I apologize for that. Um, you know, maybe we want to we wanna actually use Kafka, and I've used it every single other place I've ever been, and it's not going to work here. And that's okay, because it, I just fold and move on. Because I'm going to learn through the process of that, I'm going to have that discovery. Because tomorrow I'll be smarter than I am today. I need to seek out this new information, right? We fall in love with things, like, I apparently have this sick love of Kafka, because I brought it up like eight, nine times now. We all, have the, we all have these techniques and practices, right, that are our go-to go lines, our go-through solutions to common problems that we have. You know, and maybe it's a library that's like super outdated and buggy. You know, I've got some of those in my back pocket, and it's just, I use it all the time, and I'm comfortable with it. But those things eventually become an albatross and a millstone around your neck because they are these leprechauns, these myths that we're telling ourselves about how the way the world works. We refer to those in the poker world as leaks, and we spend a lot of time looking for them. Um, I've got several hundred thousand hands of poker in a database, and I crunch those numbers all the time, looking for ways that I'm playing badly. And I do the same thing with my code, right? Like, I am out there training on my code all the time. I run static analysis tools, and I run tests, and I've got all of these different ways of metricing what I do to try to understand where my own personal, I don't want to say failures are, but where could I be better? How could I improve? Because we have to live in this world where we have to hold these two very conflicting ideas 
in our head at the same time. Um, one is that we're the best MFer in the room at all times. And the other one is that, well, I could do a little bit better. And that is really, that can be a really hard brain shift. And a lot of people go too far one way or the other. Some people, you know, it's sort of the imposter syndrome. Well, I could be a lot better. I'm not doing good work at all. This is horrible. Versus people who just like roll through the entire department as, you know, the golden child who's going to solve all of our problems. Finding a balance in there is going to open up so many new doors for you. Uh, and you can defeat almost any sort of villain that you'll come across. Because the key to the game in poker is playing the player, not the cards. Right? I understand your tendencies, and I figure out what you do. I play the people in software. What are their needs and desires? What are the motivations of the people I work with? What problems are what problems that other department that keeps trying to add more JavaScript? Right? Like I kind of roll my eyes, but like there's a reason why they're doing that. What are their motivations? What are their incentives that they're making those sorts of decisions? What problems are they trying to solve with that? Can I offer them a better solution instead of just assuming that they're trying to make life difficult for me? Only once in my life has someone tried to make life difficult for me. So it's really about the people ops understanding the process of what you're doing and how to perfect that rather than perfecting the results and developing those strong social skills and the empathy like Alex was speaking to earlier today. That's what I got. I hope you all are happy here in Boulder.